Can I just? Oh, you quickly... have some things to say. Yes. Go right um, ahead. Oh, President, just very, very first. quickly. The TAM 2022 members only star party dates have been released. All members should have received an email with those dates and some of the updates to the rules. And all of the dates are also on our website. And then as some might know, Linda, our wonderful SFAA speaker chair retired in December of this past year. The board is eternally grateful for all of her hard work for and with the SFAA over her tenure. Linda has also found over 200 speakers during her time as speaker chair. All of our members, the past current board and guests are very appreciative of the variety of lecture subjects we have all been lucky enough to attend or in past two years listen to. So I wanna say a big thank you to Linda for all you have done for the SFAA. Everyone is eternally grateful. Thank you, and I've loved every minute of it. It's been 17 years, and uh, it'll be over 200 people. And the next six months of this year, I've already got speakers chosen. But anyone who would like to consider having this wonderful job, I will be so happy to help them get launched into becoming a, a speaker. Be over chosen. And the next six months of this year, I. What what did I hear? I think it was just a uh, re reverb of the live feed. Ah, okay. Yeah, we have some very, very interesting talks coming coming up this year already. So I love to do this. <clears throat> Thank you, Linda. Thank you. And this beautiful piece was done by Jessica, original art, original calligraphy that she gave me today. And it's quite beautiful. <clears throat> and uh, beautiful writing in the back from her training as a calligrapher. So thank you, I will treasure this forever. <clears throat> so shall I begin? Yes, that's all I have. So this is a special, special night celebrating San Francisco Amateur Astronomer's 70th anniversary. And we'll have three longtime members sharing their experiences with our founding. But first I want to mention, as I usually do the next two months talks, February uh, 16th, um, Ariana Gleason Holbrook from Stanford and SLAC, the National Accelerator Lab at Berkeley, um, I mean, uh, at Stanford rather, will be speaking when and where life originated on Earth and if or where life exists elsewhere in the cosmos are some of the biggest unanswered scientific questions of our time. Using SLAC's X-ray free electron laser, we will learn how the process of shock compression may hold the key to revealing the origin of life. So the lecture talk is shocking origins, meteor impacts, and the chemistry of life. Then on March 16th, Ken Lum will be speaking. He's been a longtime friend of SFAA and, and belongs to more than one of the local Bay Area astronomy clubs. He's very, very interested in this. And um, he says that more than most scientific disciplines, it has progressed only as a result of the advances in the instrumentation, particularly the instrumentation of the telescope. In 1955, which is just three years be, beyond uh, our, our anniversary. So Lou Epstein may be familiar with this book. Henry C. King wrote a book, The History of the Telescope. And then in 1992, a group of mostly amateur astronomers established the Antique Telescope Society. Ken Lum will talk about their annual visits to examine historical telescopes like the Leviathan at Parsonstown and other great historical telescopes. He will visit to examine these historical telescopes and other areas of research for the ATS. And we will see many examples of their amazing experiences. So we look forward to travels into astronomy history in the month of March. Tonight's speakers were so um, pleased to have First, Lou Epstein, Louis Epstein. Louis Epstein is a founding member of SFAA in 1952 and served on the board for over a decade. He earned his PhD in physics in the 1960s. He worked for Philco Ford Aerospace Division for several years. He was featured on the cover of Sky and Telescope magazine in the 60s, and his article on the all-reflecting schmidt cassegrain Telescope designed and built by Chrysler Corporation under Lou's supervision. 
published two books in physics, Thinking Physics and Relativity Visualized in the 80s and other articles that were in the American Journal of Physics and Physics Teacher. He worked on the Saturn moon rocket in, the in 1964, and he made the first plans for a 200 inch telescope to be orbited by a Saturn booster. He also had made plans for telescopes to be set up, 200 inch telescopes, I meant, let's see, for telescopes to be set up on the moon. He taught astronomy and physics for a total of 40 years. Taught at the Air Force Academy, UC Berkeley, UC San Diego, UC Davis, the Louisiana State University in New Orleans and the City of College of San Francisco for over 10 years. He's given many astronomy talks to San Francisco amateur astronomers and other organizations on astronomy and physics. We will benefit very much from hearing Lou's perspective on our history. Joining us after Lou speaks is Mary Ingle. She joined the SFAA in the 1970s and has been a loyal member of SFAA for 40 plus years. She heard about the telescope makers workshop in a physics class at City College of SF, then built her eight inch telescope at the Chabot Telescope Makers Workshop in Oakland in 79 to 80 while in grad school. She was a past president and the first woman of SFAA and the first woman to hold that post. She's also held SFAA positions as vice president, publicity director, recruiting speakers and SFA newsletter editor for many years and she's had many other positions within SFAA. She's retired now, but worked as an analyst for the California Digital Library, the 10 campus digital library for the University of California system for 22 years. She has spent countless nights observing at Fiddletown Observatory in the Sierra foothills and enjoyed every minute of it. And she attends most lectures and she's usually sitting there with her notebook, writing notes mm -hmm. on most everything the speaker has to say. Um, we're also going to be joined after Mary Speaks by Tom Gellog. Kellogg. In 1976, he received a BS in physics, and his professor nurtured his interest in astronomy. In 82, Tom met the famous John Dobson, and he attended the meetings and then joined the SFAA at Randall. He was a member of the board and later became vice president. He was the lead organizer for the Mount Tam Star Parties for a few years and he seldom missed a lecture or a star party. Sky and Telescope published an article that he wrote in, on sidewalk astronomy in August of 1990. He's also published a series of articles for the Bernal Journal and, in, and the SFAA newsletter in the 80s and the 90s. Um, we welcome Lou, Mary, and Tom as they will add their memories of SFAA and they take us on a travel through history. Thank you so much, and we look forward to hearing from you. <clears throat> Lou Epstein will speak first. Okay. Well, in the in the good old days, the telescope making was the, the, one of the main activities of amateur astronomers, not only in San Francisco, but uh, all over the world, pretty much. And of course, the reason was that. Um, in those days, you, uh, telescopes were expensive and, and uh, hard to get. And, and so if you wanted a telescope, you had to, uh, had to make one. And, and, and it, 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 it's kind of tricky. It's kind of particularly with your first telescope. And, and, and that, that caused a good deal of occasion for exchanging information. Uh, of course, the star parties were, were a big thing in those days, too. We'd go up to uh, uh, Mount Diablo was a, fa uh, 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 a, a big place ha for, for star parties because um, a star party in those days not only meant that you invited many people with, with their different telescopes, whatever they had, but it was put on by different astronomical societies would get together in order to get enough telescopes uh, for something to happen. And San Francisco astro uh, amateur astronomers, the East Bay Astronomical Society, the society from Davis up, on, up near Sacramento, the society from Sacramento, and even there was an astronomical society in Stockton. And they would all get together 
to have enough telescopes and people to have a star party. And as I said, a favorite place was Mount Diablo. Um, I went up on Mount Diablo, I guess, a couple of years ago now. Maybe it's quite a few years ago. And uh, the whole, the whole uh, San Joaquin Valley there in the Walnut Creek Valley, um, they're all filled with lights. You wouldn't, you wouldn't think that was a place for a star party now, but the world has, the world has changed. And uh, I, I guess the, uh, these uh, um, diode lights, these bright, intense diode lights have written the doom of, of astronomy near cities. Uh, they're so darn bright. Um, so, so, so uh, that was that was that was it. The in the talks in those days, um, uh, at the if, particularly at the San Francisco a Amateur Astronomers and also at the East Bay, would cover many things besides astronomy. There were talks, uh, a, a good many talks on geology and, and and earthquakes, and and there were even talks on mathematics. Sometime you might remember from high school that you, that you learned in Algebra 1 that uh, A squared plus, no, A plus B squared, A plus B squared equals A squared plus 2AB plus B squared. And that was sort of an algebraic thing. Maybe you learned it by heart, but at the Amateur Astronomers, there was a talk one time and they they, they, they brought in uh, a man, a mathematician man, and he showed on the blackboard why that was so with geometry. And uh, he showed a lot of other things too. But I, I mentioned this so that um, uh, you, you realize that uh, there was a lot more to amateur astronomy than just the stars. Of course, I also remember that someone... Um, objected to that, oh, 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 all that talk about geology and rocks and whatnot. And, um, uh, but, but it was pointed out that after all, the earth itself is a planet. And uh, so maybe we should have some talks on the earth too. Uh, be the, and, and the atmosphere too. And uh, astronomers, amateur astronomers, all astronomers are always having a fight with the atmosphere. So maybe it would be a, a good subject for a couple of talks. Uh, so, so, so good enough. Um, I guess I'm beginning to run out of time. So I want to come to a conclusion. Um, I want to say what. What good, what good is amateur astronomy? Uh, after all, the things they play with are mostly ideas and observations and instruments that were, were that have been in service or planned or known or understood for for a hundred years. So, so what, what 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 what's with these amateur astronomers? Now, I'm going to tell you the biggest service that amateur astronomy has done. And it's something you should bear in mind and always be proud of. In recent decades, too, there were two big scientific projects. One, of course, was the, um, the, the new space telescope. What's the name of the man? Uh, oh. Hubble. Not Hubble. No, no. no. James Webb. What? James, James Webb. Webb. James Webb. Yeah, yeah. So there's a new space telescope, and it's not even in orbit uh, near the Earth. It's way out at the at the Lagrange points. That'd be an interesting subject to talk about. What makes the Lagrange points? But anyway, uh, the James Webb telescope is one of one of the big things that's happened in the last uh, decade or so. There's something else that happened, and perhaps you won't know it, but it's called the Superconducting Super Collider. How many people are familiar with that name? Yeah. So some people aren't fam even familiar with it. Well, 
It was to be the biggest atom smasher in the world on the earth. And, and uh, it was going to be located in Texas. And, and it, it, would, it also would, would, had it been built, it would do v various fundamental things like the space telescope will do fundamental things that will tell us maybe about the beginning of the universe and things like that. But the superconducting super collider, which was to be built in Texas, would show us things about the atoms and the, and the things about the, the little pieces that the world is made of. And I mean little <laughs> pieces. See, the, the, the pieces seem to have pieces inside of them. First, there were molecules, and then there were atoms inside the molecule. Then there were protons and electrons inside the atom. And then there were quarks inside the protons. I, I won't go on, but it, it goes on. It's, it's, it's like uh, one of those Russian dolls that has dolls inside <laughs> of it. Um, now, the... Um, if you want to know, I'm, I'm an astronomer, but I will tell you honestly that probably the most important of those two projects would have been, is that for me to shut up? No. Okay, the okay. superconducting super collider would have probably been the most important. And, and, and um, it, it was discontinued but for financial reasons. It, the, the cost was up at two billion dollars, and Congress, in its wisdom, discontinued the funding. And now there's uh, there's just a hole in the ground in Texas where it was supposed to be built. Um, on the other hand, the, the James Webb Telescope, we know, God bless it. I hope it keeps going, but it's so far it's going great, and I hope it keeps on going great. Now, now. Why did Congress discontinue the super collider and let the space telescope go forward? Uh, it, both of these projects consume about $10 billion. If, if you were my class, I'd ask you how many zeros was in a billion, but it's not my class. Um, it's a big number. There's a couple of zeros in $10 billion. Why did Congress knock off the space, the uh, the super collider, and and uh, let, let 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 the space telescope move forward? And I'll, now I'm going to tell you why. Here's the answer: the space telescope had a constituency. A constituency is a bunch of people who are interested and who talk about it and read about it. Unfortunately. The superconducting super collider had no constituency. In other words, there were a few people that were interested in it, but, but the public, by and large, didn't even know what it was. And 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 and, and where does the constituency come from for the space telescope that sees that it that it goes forward? It's the amateur astronomers. They're the people that talk about it. There, there are hundreds of them, in, in it, and 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 it's and they talk about it and tell what it will do and what it, what what ha what might happen to it and th this and that. And who when when do you, when do you hear talks about muons and partons and quarks? Where do you you don't go to hear lectures about that? You might once in a while read an article about. It to go to a lecture, but it's it certainly for every lecture you've heard about the things in space, you, you've heard one half of one lecture about about the nuclear particles, and it's because you want to hear about space, and, and because you are not that interested in nuclear particles. That's the reason. That's the people. You are the people behind the space telescope. If it were to be discontinued uh, for funding, there would be a scream from every one of you and screams from plenty of other people. The, 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 uh, the, the world, uh, not only of amateur astronomers, but of just ca very casually interested people would scream 
And why? Because you stirred them up with the talk of amateur astronomy. Most people have never taken an astronomy class. Maybe they've never even read an astronomy book, but they're, they're, they're surely interested. If you talk about it at dinner or lunch, uh, there's, there's surely an ear of, of somebody that's interested in hearing what that amateur astronomer says. So feel proud of what you've done. It, it, it's, 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 it's you, not the scientists, not that many people go to you take astronomy in college. Oh, Linda did, but uh, <laughs> that, 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 that's, that's, uh, that's about it. Okay, how much time have I got left? You can be done any time, or you. Can I'm out of time. Okay. You can be. You can go on if you have other things to say. Well, it's, it, it's no. I, I think I'll, I'll. I don't want to step on anybody else's time, so <laughs> I'll let you all go. Okay. Can I switch chairs with you? Now here comes Mariengo. Okay, so you Thank can you very switch much. chairs. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lewis. You're welcome. I'm seeing applause in the chat room. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Can you get your foot? There you go. All right. Great. Okay. All right. Now I'm going to get my. Let, let, let me say a word that goes to the introduction of Mary Engel. Um, <laughs> one thing that I knew in, 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 in I, of course, as a science major, you know, there weren't too many girls in science. Uh, and I'll, I'll tell you that there, there surely weren't. There weren't girls in physics, there weren't girls in mathematics, and there certainly weren't girls in astronomy. And, and the first uh, girl who was really enthusiastic about astronomy that I ever met was Mary Engel. That, uh, not, now I, I think there are a dime a dozen, but in those days there was Mary Engel. And Mary Engel built her own telescope. Uh, and I think it was a 10 or an eight. eight. An eight, eight inch, inch, which was a fairly big reflecting telescope because other people that built a first telescope would build a six inch. But Mary built an eight inch telescope herself. Holy cow. And she was a girl. Holy <laughs> cow. Uh, okay. Okay, that's enough. All right, good. So I'm going to go to um, get this out of here. Oh, oh, I keep wanting to do that. Let's see. Share screen. All right. Then I'm going to go to this one. And then uh, how did we get that up to the very? Um, on the left, the from the beginning button under file. Um, so you mouse down a little bit and click from the beginning. Oh, from the beginning. There it is. Yeah. Oh, good. Okay, there we go. All right, great. Well, I, Lou and I are going to overlap a little bit, but I have more detail and more pictures and things like that. Um, he's so correct about the fact that there were just no commercial telescopes that were affordable um, or you know, readily available. It was very hard to find a telescope. And so it was, in fact, um, an, there was a need to make your own. So, and and also the, the opticians have told me that in the early days, there were the ma machines that built that ground and polished lenses and mirrors were not perfected to a degree that there were if there was a repetition error, so if a, a machine, as the thing is circulating and it's grinding, had a little blip in it, that blip would be consistently all the way across the mirror. So uh, those errors had not been solved in the, at least in the 50s and possibly the 60s. And so handmade telescopes were just still the best mirrors and the best lenses that you could get. Um, and then it also required a lot of stuff, lays, drill presses, all kinds of um, blanks and abrasives. And uh, along came Skipper Wallace, who actually had made his own telescope and he decided to um, invite people to his own home where he had all this stuff set up and had his own little workshop. So, and, you know, to save money, they used all kinds of Mickey Mouse stuff, irrigation pipes and pipe fittings. I mean, it works 
fine, but it, it's not as elegant as the telescopes nowadays. Um, then Skipper actually knew or found out that the Randall Museum had a lower level that was empty. It was not being used at all. So they he implored them to make the space available for a workshop. And in fact, they agreed. So he brought all of his equipment, all these lathes and drill presses and everything to set up in the basement. And they took, um, they decided that along with this, they should form a society that will bring people in and, and spread the word a little bit more, have everybody um, be, uh, have the opportunity to make their own telescope. So Harry Epstein, Lewis's father, set up the nonprofit corporation for the SFAA, consulting with Betty Neal, who had done that very same thing for the East Bay Astronomical Association. Um, the original members, Wallace, Jack Garriott, who we have who actually wrote a little thing that's on the website that's very nice about the early days, Stanley Oliver, Herman Fast, and then the three Epsteins, Harry and Lewis and Robert, which were, who were his teenage sons. This is Lou and Betty Neal. This is quite a few years later. Uh, she was still organizing for East Bay Astronomical Society and, um, you know, until... Is she, I guess she's passed away by now. Huh? Yes. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. And um, so I just thought maybe somebody would like to see who hasn't made a telescope, what's going on with it. So these are pictures that I happen to have. Um, you use a mirror blank, this big piece on the bottom here, and you, you use a tool on the top, which is also a piece of glass. And between them, then you have different varying degrees of abrasives and water. So it's like sandpaper. You have 50 grit, 80 grit, 200, 400, 800, like that. And you start out with the very roughest ones. You carve out the depression in the mirror, and then you use the finer grits to shape the parabola. And all the while, you are testing, testing, uh, and, and uh, this is a Foucault test here where... Um, Pretty sure we use the Ronke screen. You have a little um, screen with uh, cr cross hatching on it. And it when you shine a beam of light onto the surface of the mirror sitting up, the beam comes back across the room and you put your little Ronke screen in front of that. It takes the shape of the surface. So this is um, going towards a parabola here. It's a little thin on the edge, but you, what you want is kind of even spaces all the way along and not such a big groove in the, in the center. Uh, and you know that they did not test the Hubble telescope. They had this huge telescope and they never sat it up on its side. Perkin Elmer was the designer and fabricator of the tele of the glass. Am I right on that? I yes, think I'm, yes. Yeah. What? And and they never. I read that they never set it up and tested. Had they done this simple test, would have you know? But it was no minor feat to stand a telescope that big up. This is actually not. This is my eight inch. This is not my eight inch. This is like a twelve inch telescope right here. A mirror right here. And so anyway, <laughs> they would have saved a lot of trouble there because it didn't see well when it finally got um, up in space. And so, and I, I, I have an optician friend who took me up to Tinsley Optics where they made the corrector for the Hubble telescope. And the piece was just, oh, it was the size of your thumbnail. It was so small, but it was shaped in exactly the correction that was needed by the mirror. And um, that's what they shot into space. That was pretty exciting and fun to see. And then, then all of a sudden they had this picture of the Hubble telescope with glasses on. It was very cute and, and it really corrected it. Do okay. you know who the last picture here working on the mirror is? That's me. That's Marianne. Yeah, 30 years ago, maybe. <laughs> really a long time ago. Okay. And then um, 
Okay, so here's some successful handmade telescopes. Here's Herman Fast with his four inch. I think it was a refractor, wasn't it? It was, it was not a, a reflector. No, it was a refractor. It was a refractor. Uh, Bill Charrington with his 18 inch evergreen reflecting telescope and me with the final product that I had, um, you know, and this was a real feat for me and for all the other women in, in those days, because what happened in high school when the boys all took machine shop or wood working shop, but the girls were not encouraged to do that. They made me take home ec. And so I made this dress with one sleeve inside out and one sleeve right side in. You know, I wasn't interested in that. But anyway, I did get help making the mount out of wood. And but I then had I found all the parts. This is a Dobsonian mount. And it is, I have to say, absolutely ingenious. There's two little pieces of Teflon that sit there. And this was a ring that held computer tapes when they were not being used and stored on the rack and it just glided perfectly. I had counterweights in the back and a finder, uh, the counterweights balanced both the finder and the um, diagonal on the, on the front. Anyway, it was great fun making it and I'm glad I did. Okay, eventually as time passes, everybody does also pass. And then uh, it's, people came along like John Dobson who, always had a workshop and was always out there on the street corners of San Francisco and other places. So people really, uh, he drew so many people into telescope making and into amateur astronomy as, as a result. There was also the Chabot Telescope Makers Workshop in Oakland. And that's actually where I went. I found out about the Chabot uh, workshop in a physics class in, um, or astronomy class, I guess, in City College of San Francisco. And by that time, then, of course, all the old timers who knew how to work all this equipment in the Randall Museum uh, were gone. So they it went unused and the library was locked up and inaccessible. So eventually the Randall wanted the space back and we just had a giant auction uh, in San Francisco and sold off all the equipment and, and all the, you know, the lays and the drill presses that were Wallace's original equipment. So the SFAA then started concentrating on, you know, there was still a definitely a place observing opportunities. People went to um, all kinds of wonderful sites. Um, and I have one memory that I would love to share. It was, we were at Digger Pine and I bet there were a dozen people from the SFAA and Digger Pine State Park is over there somewhere in the East Bay by Livermore, I think, south of Livermore. And, uh, you know, it was getting late at night. It was three, 4 a.m. And everybody had gone to bed except for Herman Fast and I. And we, here we are looking for things that have just come up and we don't get a chance to see very often. It was summertime and all of a sudden a huge meteor streaked across the sky. And I mean, it was wide across the sky. It exploded right in the middle of the sky and cast so much light that it turned night into day. We cast distinct shadows and, uh, it, and then it streaked the rest of the way across the sky with color, colors, all kinds of beautiful colors that were um, metals burning or whatever. We were so excited. We jumped up and down. <laughs> we didn't, I don't know if we woke anybody up, but it was, it was, I think, my favorite astronomy experience of all time. It was just great. So the SFAA also had an armchair set. So we had monthly lectures and we had, you know, as you are enjoying right now, um, Berkeley, Stanford, NASA, JPL, all these places have um, people and we, we, you know, you, we plied them with the thing that, well, you're doing this on public funding, so you should give back to the public. So uh, for many years, I did that. I was a recruiter for speakers. And so I know they, but they were very responsive. Everybody was good. Uh, we also did field trips. We went to Lick Observatory and a number of other places. And it was just, um, so there was still really 
a, a distinct place, even though it wasn't a telescope making club anymore, specifically the SFAA still had a huge niche to fill because the interest in astronomy was so great. Um, then eventually we got, there were people at the Academy of Sciences who were members of the SFAA um, who then invited us in to use first, I think the Goethe room, which is a nice little room. And then secondly, we have branched into the planetarium. Um, we got a lot of new members by, uh, by virtue of our being at the Academy. And then the leadership changed. This is Dave Charlotte, uh, who was president at, at the time. This was in the 70s. Uh, here's Lou and Nick Canis, who was also a board member. And I thought if Nick was on here, his this is his son. I would ask him how old his son is now. I don't know, but that was quite a while ago. But anyway, it was a nice set of people interested and uh, astronomy enthusiasts. Then the observers also changed a bit. Um, this is Steve Gottlieb on the upper left, who was the most productive observer that I have ever known. He, um, next to the comet hunters, let's say, but he was out there equally as often as the comet hunters. He would correct the catalogs. So he would, first he worked his way through, the, you know, the easy stuff, the messy objects. And then he started on the big catalogs and observed every single thing that was within his, the range of his telescope and um, went on to the next, you know, there's volumes and volumes. And eventually he ended up working with international groups to really um, improve the accuracy of the star catalogs. So that was, uh, he was great fun to observe with because he would have very faint, unusual things that most people did not even bother to put in their telescopes. Um, this is Ken Wilson on the upper right here. He ran the planetarium and that's how we got, we actually ended up meeting in the planetarium and that was really exciting that was great fun he is now in virginia he went out to they have a big planetarium out there and that he's retired now but he uh, he did that for a while then bob kessner here he's an optician and he built this observatory uh, near Fiddletown, California. This is the building here this little square and then the roof rolled off onto these pillars um, and it was so easy to do this that I could do it by myself. Um, it, it's not in good shape now. I think it's probably 40 years old or more, but, um, and then here's, and this is Bill Charrington. Oops, sorry. Bill Charrington and his son, Mark. And here's Bill with Evergreen again, his uh, 18 inch telescope. And Bill was a regular and he would drag that telescope to the Riverside uh, telescope in the Texas Star Party all over the country. He was great and he just loved it. Okay, so this is then we also had uh, the SFAA used both Mount Tam and Fiddletown at the time. Um, this is a morning after picture, so everybody looks like they're half dead. But here's Herman Fast, Michael Thwaites, Charlie Stiffelmeyer, Bill Charrington, me, and Bob Kessner. And um, that, it was just the most wonderful place. Um, the, the road is now washed out and difficult, and they have to keep putting money into just that kind of uh, infrastructure. But uh, it's, it was a really nice hillside and or I mean hilltop in the uh, gold country and this is Mark Charrington and Bob Douglas and I'm, I think this picture looks like it might have been taken at the Randall and Carl Trost and I have one thing to tell you about Carl Trost was a wonderful he was a member for just so many years Carl was some kind of an engineer do you remember what kind he was uh -huh electrical engineer. Well, he was interested in all this stuff to the amazing degree. So he would bring in photographs that he took up on um, Twin Peaks, the specter of the Brocken. I don't know if anybody's heard of that, but that was one of the names. It was probably had other names um, for this optical phenomenon. It's a solar phenomenon. So you have the person standing there the sun behind them, 
and the fog be in front of them and their image would be cast onto the fog with a halo around their bodies. It's just, it was amazing. And he got all kinds of pictures like that. And I don't know what he's going to do with his uh, photograph library, but he has some real gems there that would be best um, shared somehow on the internet, you know, because nobody took pictures like that. And nobody had that kind of skill and that knowledge to do that. So anyway, Carl was just absolutely great guy. And then how about women in astronomy? And at, as Lou mentioned, women were there from the very first. This is Betty Neal, who was the, a real organizer for the um, East Bay Astronomical and the SFAA. Um, here's, this is Edwina Charrington right here and Amy McManus, who's with us tonight. And um, both of them spent so much time organizing various activities to get us out there you know, for star parties and picnics and whatever else we had. We had or very organized picnics kind of regularly. Um, Nancy Cox was the president for a while and vice president. She, she actually conceived of an experiment to put on the space shuttle and won a contest to get her experiment set sent up into space and then they brought her back data and she crunched it and I don't re actually remember what the experiment was about uh, but she did do a talk on it I recall and uh, so yeah those were there have been plenty of women from the very first uh, and you know I think that some of these hurdles that we had to overcome not knowing how to use a drill press or a lathe or not having the skills and the familiarity with the machines that were required so it was uh, it was a little more challenging but we always had help and women are still present and active when I came back to the SFAA I was gone for a few years when I had twins, twin babies, and I was way over my head. You know, that was the biggest challenge of my life. Making the telescope was simple compared to that. But anyway, um, Shelly Beard was then president. Uh, Angie Traeger took over from her. And Linda Mahan, uh, you're the best speaker finder we've ever had. You're just absolutely great. And Jessica, thank you for all the work you've done as the current president. And Liz Triggs, we're just so grateful for all you women being involved because it encourages other women to get involved. And, you know, people are, you know, they get intimidated if it's just a sea of men. So um, thank you all for being there. Oh, what happened here? No, is that might be the last slide. I think that might be it. Yeah. Yeah, I think it is. Okay. So I'm going to give it back. Okay. okay. Thank you. So I guess I'll start now, Mary? Yes. Is that it? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Well, a couple of comments about, I really enjoyed both of your talks. And, and Carl Trost lives just uh, less than a mile from where I used to live in San Francisco. Oh. And so I was going to visit him pretty regularly for a couple of years, and I believe he's moved to um, Sonoma County or something to a, a facility there, to a senior facility. But I haven't seen him for a couple of years. But he would not only that, but his a lot of his pictures showed up in Sky and Telescope. I saw them regularly. Wonderful. Yeah. So I, I remember that, that about him. But he had pictures that were published in Sky and Telescope fairly regularly. And Nancy Cox, she actually operated the Hubble Space Telescope. She was selected to do that, I think, two years in a row, I think. So that Thank was you, Tom. I couldn't remember exactly. So yeah. it wasn't the space shuttle. It was the Hubble. Wow. Oh, yeah. yeah. Good and for it was, her. She, she gave a couple of talks about the times that she, she did that, each for a couple of right. years. But that was really fascinating, what, what she was able to do. So my talk, I've uh, written some things out here. So first of all, I, I like to ask, what event inspired you to look up at night and become an amateur astronomer? What, what event? Uh, for me, it started when I was very young. 
a very bright shooting star caught my attention while I was at church, a church fiesta in upstate New York near Rochester, New York in the 1960s. And it, it lights all over the place in this church fiesta, very bright lights. But this shooting star kind of sounds like what Mary had seen, probably not quite that bright, but it was, it was quite the shooting star. And I knew nothing about astronomy, but it, I remember, I just about wet my pants right there. It was, it was so exciting. And I asked several people around me if they saw it, nobody else saw it, <laughs> but I was so thrilled about it. Then in 1972, after I graduated from high school, I went to the Rochester Museum of Science. There's a Strasbourg planetarium there. And on the roof, they had a telescope and they were looking at Saturn at night. So that was my first time to look through a telescope in my senior year of high school or the, after, my, after I graduated. And I, uh, the Saturn just pulled the innermost strings of my soul. My college physics professor in, in Kansas, I went to college in Kansas, let me use a small telescope while I was, uh, and I was launched into the cosmic wanderings of uh, amateur astronomy. And it was in 1982, several years after graduating from college, that I moved to San Francisco and soon stumbled upon a very old man with a solar telescope in Golden Gate Park. That was John Dobson, who became my mentor. I bought a 10 inch Dobsonian telescope. Uh, I did try to build a telescope when I was in college, but I never did finish it. <laughs> so I'm not quite in the club of people who built and used their own telescope. But I bought a 10 inch Dobsonian telescope and joined his effort to invite passers by to look through the eyepiece. Eventually, I learned about San Francisco amateur astronomers and started attending meetings at Randall Museum in the mid 1980s. And when I was on the board, Mary and Lou were both on the board at the time. So um, I, I remember them. Uh, and I, I didn't really know that much about Lou or, or Mary until mostly until tonight. It was nice to hear about your backgrounds. John Dobson spoke there at our club meetings, as well as many other uh, important astronomers. Jill Turner from SETI spoke there a few times. Patrick Moore, he was an author, and he spoke there in the 80s and 90s. Often the month after the lecture, a headline article in Sky and Telescope was on the topic of discussion, uh, topic discussed at the meeting. And sometimes the uh, speaker at the SFAA was the author of the art article or was mentioned in the article. And this continues to happen with Linda's, Linda's uh, people that she's been inviting over the past 17 years. It, it's repeatedly happening where we have amazing speakers at our, at our club meetings. SFAA became my way to fully understand our place in the cosmos. SFAA provided a place where I could join in the conversation one-on-one -on -one with astronomers. Think of it, what we can do. I mean, when, before uh, COVID, I would always stay after the lectures and, and usually there's a group of 10 or 20 of us that would gather around the speaker and we would talk with them. And then before the lecture, uh, there, there was uh, um, meals that would be had with the speaker. And uh, so those, th those are opportunities to actually speak one-on-one -on -one with astronomers. And this was such a nurturing thing for my ability to understand astronomy. The star parties of Mount Tam helped me to be able to star hop to many deep sky wonders and share them with others. Sidewalk astronomy, as led by my mentor, John Dobson, has been my focus and continued. And I continue to set up my eight inch telescope in my new hometown of Aptos in Santa Cruz County. As John Dobson did, I encourage all amateur astronomers to set up their telescope on moonlit nights to show the views of the moons and the planets. You'd be surprised how many people have never been invited to look at the heavens through the eyepiece of the telescope. And I would venture to say that close to half the people that stopped to look through my telescope 
just in the, I, my payment is to, for them to say, wow. <laughs> and that's it. I just love to hear that wow. And I'd say about half of them had never looked through a telescope before at the stars. I think of it uh, in 1952, spaceships did not exist. And in these 70 years, astronomy has grown well beyond what any of the original SFAA club members could have possibly hoped for. And I, I, I really think it's uh, a wonderful thing that Lou keeps coming, and one, our only original member. <laughs> and he has been the most consistent person that I have seen in meetings over the years. And I have... I, I took a break when I became a dad um, and uh, more involved with my family in the, in the late 90s and uh, in, the, in the 2000s. But uh, then I got more active again later on in, the, in about in a decade ago or so. And then three years ago, I moved. So, um, but that's basically my talk. And I see James Webster is, is uh, listening in to this uh, talk as well. And he, he was an important part of of my and Anthony um, Bart, I always get your last name uh, not quite right, but uh, Anthony Barrio has uh, also been a very active member of the club for quite a few years. So um, that's it for me, uh, and, and we'll have time for questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. I see applause. I would like to add one thing to Tom's uh, comment that we did have really great speakers. We had um, George Smoot from Berkeley mm. right after he won the Nobel Prize for creating an image of the lumpy early universe. And it was so exciting because I had been reading about him for months and here he was in the flesh. We really have had some terrific terrific speakers. We're fortunate to live where we have access to, to Stanford, Berkeley, NASA, Lawrence Livermore Lab. I mean, we are, we are in such a fortunate spot to have wonderful speakers. And uh, yeah. so we're quite, quite fortunate about that. I'll, I'll add one more thing before I moved. Linda was nudging at me to become the speaker seeker. <laughs> And I was thinking about it, but um, I'm, I'm definitely not going to do it now. But um, she has done a really great job. And, and I would I just certainly hope that somebody uh, steps up for that position. Yeah. I love doing it. I love it. Yeah. Okay. I just wanted to. Do it. Huh? We love having you do it. Oh, work. I know, I know. <laughs> I just want to, you, you made me think of something that, that uh, you know, I love the lectures, I love the whole SFA part, but I love the nights when we can have the public. And of course we haven't during COVID and I don't think it's scheduled into the coming, coming year. Yeah. But but yeah. Norman and my greatest joy was that he had, he had a super um, um, binoculars on a tripod and I had my, my um, Celestron 11 and we, we would have, rows of people on TAM, as all of you probably are, are aware of. And I had a little ladder at my telescope with a little fleecy cover so children could hold the, the ladder and not be cold because it gets cold and damp up there. And it also prevented them from grabbing the, the eyepiece because, you know, they're getting, <laughs> but, but I treasured the moments when a child would come up to the telescope and they'd look at something. And there was that, whoa, you were talking about Tom, where they just go, whoa. What was that? And I turn around to the people in line every time and I said, you folks are going to have to wait while this child looks one more time. So then I'd have the child look again at usually the moon or Jupiter or Saturn, Mars, something like that. And then I would have them look through the Telrad so they could see the circle in the sky and, and correspond where precisely they were looking. And I know without a doubt, they will never forget it. And every time I've asked a speaker in all these many years, one of the first things I asked the speaker, when did you become interested in astronomy? And I would say conservatively, 75% of them would say, when I was a young person, I looked through a telescope and I saw Jupiter, Mars, Saturn, or some other object, and I was hooked right then and there. And, and I say conservatively, 75% of our speakers have done that. 
So that, that is the treasure of SFAA, to have that opportunity to have a line of people looking through a telescope on a mountain on a reasonably clear night, and I miss it terribly. I'd like to read some of the comments, if I may, um, and I would invite others if they want just to unmute themselves um, to, to speak up. But Tim says, thank you. And, and Doug says, uh, Carl was an influence when I made my first telescope in John Dobson's class. I was thinking of going big and he recommended making a 16 inch. And I did. Mm -hmm. I don't recommend starting that large for one's first telescope, but I did. <laughs> Um, Jim also says, thank you. Great slides, great history. Philippe says, great information, fantastic. Um, thank you from Liz. Interesting walk down memory lane. Anthony says, thanks, and great to see the pictures and hear the stories. One note on the telescope making class. I had taken it from John Dobson, I think it was 2008. Uh, my coworker, Dave Fry, who had built some of his own telescopes and taken John Dobson's class years before that uh, got me involved to take the class. And Ken Frank and um, bring a blanket his name at the moment, but another longtime member were co-teaching it with, and John Dobson was doing the lecture. And then Dave Fry picked it up and Ken Frank picked it up after that. And since they weren't able to, I picked up teaching the class and then, well, it hasn't been going since COVID and we've had a couple times where there wasn't enough participation, but once COVID you know, hopefully lapses, we we'll definitely have intent to teach it again at the ramp. Mm -hmm. So I have seen that the Mount Tam Rangers have, uh, I'm not sure, I kind of glanced at it and I wasn't really sure what I was reading because I was distracted, but are we starting the star parties soon at, on Mount Tam? Which ones? The members only star parties. We have our permits. Our first one is on the 29th of this month. Great. And then we have one every month, including um, Christmas Eve, which they are allowing for the next 12 months. The wow. public nights, those are still in discussion. We are not involved in the permit process we are participants in the event. So oh. yes, as soon as we okay, know more about the public nights, I will be sending out another email. One thing to add about the Mount Tam public nights, um, a lot of people know uh, Tinker Ross who founded the public programs back in the, I wanna say early eighties, I way before my time. Um, and Tinka has been threatening to uh, step down as the chair of the astronomy program for a few years now. And uh, this year she actually did. Uh, it's a new, uh, new person running the public astronomy program. I, I should have pulled up the email. Douglas, isn't that his name, Jessica? There are actually a couple of people because Tinka did about 12 people's jobs. So we will be dealing with a couple. They have one that is dealing with the parking lot and the permit process. So, yeah. And, and Tucker Hyatt is still going to be uh, managing the, the, recruiting the speakers, mm -hmm. introducing right. the speakers from Wonderfest. Yeah, he does a great job. And uh, he has a Wonderfest once a month at uh, Hop Monk in Nevada also and around other, other lectures around the Bay Area. So he's a really great person to get speakers. Anthony, it's good to see your face. It is. And Anthony, uh, he, he's a regular contributor to Sky and Telescope in terms of conversations. I always see your letters to the editors and, and back and forth conversations with some of the authors from Sky and Telescope. So um, it's it's... You're a very active participant in, the, in astronomy. Keep looking up. Well, with, with that all said, I think, um, I'm thinking of closing the stream, but we can leave the Zoom open, um, but just that we would stop broadcasting to the world, but everybody can stay and, and chat as long as they wish. Um, 
Linda, would you like to say anything further? And, and I wanna say thanks again very much to our guests for the, the, the photos and, and, and the stories. It's, it's, it's good history and it's for, for younger members, it's really easy to forget that we can just go and buy these, these things and do these things. And thank you for that. Well, I want to thank our speakers. I'm so pleased that, that people spoke about being people we many of us remember and uh, good back, brought back wonderful memories. But I want to thank you, Jay, for organizing it so that we can have a talk from two different locations and hook three different people up so they could do this. So I very much appreciate your help. My pleasure. It was lovely. And thank you again, Jessica, for this beautiful thank you that you brought to my house today. I so appreciate it. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I took a yeah. little artistic liberty with the space and the moon. Ah, well, um, <laughs> I'm going to show everybody one more time. This is something that she has painted and did the beautiful calligraphy. And it's really, really lovely. Thank you. And we'll all keep looking thank you up. for all your hard work. Yes, well, I, it's, 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 yeah. I think of it as really fun and illuminating and fun. <clears throat> uh, I don't know. What, one thing I will add too is way back when Lou reminded us all that the word, we, you know, we had discussions. Should we take the word amateur out of the name? We shouldn't yeah. we be the San Francisco Astronomical Association or something? And so we had prolonged discussions over that. And we, Lou reminded us that amateur is from the Latin for the love of. Mm -hmm. And I think that convinced everyone that we need to keep that in there. It was really good. I, I must confess, though, as program chair, when I ask someone to speak, and it says San Francisco Amateur Astronomers. I send them a list of the last year's speakers we've had. So they <laughs> can subtle, you. I really do, I've done it for years. So they can see that this yeah. is the director of KIPAC. Here's a person from Stanford. Here's a person that's, yeah. So they can, they can draw their conclusions and not yeah. be given a thought, amateur. <laughs> so, well, that's an excellent way to approach it. It really yeah, is. So I just, and sometimes I send them two years worth. Does it feel of, like... Of, so the meaning of the word has changed over the years in a colloquial sense? Oh, well, I don't think most people think of it as what it what it translates to. I think it means, yeah, not not very, you know, on a very, very basic level. And sometimes but, they, they flat out ask me uh, what level, you know, in, in a discreet slanty kind of way, they'll say, to what level can I address the group? You know, but, and, that, but, and I said that they're going to be, um, I said, you will be amazed at the questions you get, which I always am when Q&A comes. The speakers are blown away with the Q and A that they get. So any amateur thoughts that they had, stop. Yeah. But did seventy years ago amateur mean something different in, um, in common speak? I think uh, Lou Epstein mentioned uh, two or three years ago. He gave a talk about history, and he said that there was they wanted to distinguish this group from not being part of the professional university and manufacturing and all that that they used it to distinguish themselves from being not professionally um, trained astronomers. So they use the word amateur and some clubs have done it. There's a handful that still do in the, in the country, but um, mostly they don't, they do not. Nice. Well, once again, I'm, I'm going to close the, the live stream. So uh, <laughs> okay. thank you and good night world. Thank you. Off.